Chapter 12 The War While Pius kept secret the great discoveries going on beneath the Vatican, World War II exploded into the deadliest conflict in human history. After initial Axis victories, the tide turned in favor of the Allies. At El Alamein in the North African desert, the naval battle of Midway in the Central Pacific, and bloody Stalingrad in the Russian winter. The victory parades in Rome by black shirts carrying fasces around the Colosseum in imitation of the Roman legions disappeared. Mussolini was no Julius Caesar, and the Italian troops were no Roman legions. They died by the tens of thousands in North Africa and Russia. Death, hunger, and disease stalked every corner and almost every family in Rome. The church remained neutral, with a wink. Churches and priests throughout Europe were at the mercy of Nazi fanatics, with hundreds already imprisoned at Dachau, along with tens of thousands of Jews. To protect her own, the church maintained a pretense of neutrality while riding a tiger. In reality, the church secretly carried out a number of efforts to aid the Allies and thwart Nazi power. Although Pius and the three amigos remained in secret contact with George Strait during the war years, their respective circumstances could not have been more different. The Strakes The War Years During the war, Strake's Conroe Field was an important ingredient in fueling the Allied war effort. The Conroe Field produced 500 million barrels of crude oil the lifeblood fueling Allied planes, ships, and tanks around the globe. A special pipeline, the so-called Big Inch, was built to carry it and other Texas oil to refineries in the East and then to Europe. Strake's immense revenues continued to be contributed in substantial part to the Pope's causes. The field also enriched Conroe and formed the basis of the wealth of many others, leading to the discovery of many other smaller oil fields in similar strata in East Texas. Strake's restless soul also led him to wildcat in remote areas in other states. Although he enjoyed considerable success in locating new oil fields, neither he nor anyone else would ever duplicate the unexpected success of the Conroe field. Before World War II, the late 1930s movie Lost Horizons, based on a 1933 James Hilton bestseller, described a valley called Shangri-La in the Himalayan mountains that provided a refuge of peace for a World War I veteran from a world that was about to destroy itself in another war. As it turned out, the movie foreshadowed the coming of a Second World War. In the mountains of Colorado before World War II broke out, George Strake found the house that would become his haven from the world, his own Shangri-La. Long before, while he was on leave from the army during World War I, George had traveled to Colorado. Like so many others, he fell in love with it, vowing to his best friend that someday he would buy a mountain. In the late 1930s, he found and purchased a unique mountain valley called Glen Erie, near Colorado Springs and the Garden of the Gods. The 1,200-acre property had been developed in the Gilded Age of the 1880s and 1890s by a railroad magnate named William Palmer. As a tribute to his deceased wife and in fulfillment of a promise to her, Palmer built a large, Tudor-style castle on the property. Think of a bigger, better Downton Abbey. It had been neglected for many years since Palmer's death by a variety of owners. Strake restored it, turning it into an astounding summer place, its Queen Canyon rivaling in natural beauty the Maroon Bells Valley near Aspen. Its waterfalls, lake, and wildlife made it a summer heaven for the Strakes and their friends escaping hot, humid Houston. George added a more intimate house, the so-called Pink House, for his family and guests, and even added a bowling alley in the massive foyer of the main building. Although Strake would later sell the property for a nominal price to a Christian group, during the summers of the 1940s, it was the Strake family paradise. As the world once again turned to catastrophic war, 
Glen Erie was an oasis of peace. The Strakes, perhaps not surprisingly, were never direct friends of Howard Hughes. In those days, not the decrepit recluse of later years, but rather the brilliant founder of the early airline TWA and movie producer. Because they both had strong oil field and Houston ties and were among the wealthiest people in the United States, however, they had many common friends, both in Houston and among Hollywood movie stars. The deep Catholic faith of the Strake family contrasted with their immense wealth and sometimes created dilemmas for the Strake children. In 1943, Howard Hughes released the film The Outlaw, highlighting Jane Russell's busty cleavage. Hughes said there are two good reasons for any man to see Jane Russell in a movie, while Bob Hope called the movie star the two and only Jane Russell. The Catholic Church condemned the movie, declaring it a mortal sin to see it, a sin of sufficient gravity to cause the loss of salvation. When the young straight kids were introduced to Jane Russell and other stars of the outlaw by their parents at Glen Erie, they were terrified the entire family was risking eternal damnation. The peace of Glen Erie with its waterfalls, quiet canyons, wildlife, and nearby Eagle Lake could not have contrasted more vividly with the increasing desperation of Rome and its endangered Jews. July, 1943. The Allies destroyed the Italian and German armies in North Africa and then reached across the Mediterranean to Sicily. The spectacle of Italian crowds in Palermo and other cities wildly cheering the arrival of U.S. General Patton caused the Italian military to depose and imprison Mussolini. Walter Carroll led a team of Allied military officers to Rome, arriving at 2.30 a.m. to receive in secret the surrender of Italy from the new Italian government. The Germans struck first, however, before the nighttime surrender could take effect. Freeing Mussolini in a bold raid led by the Waffen-SS, the Germans set up a puppet Italian government and seized control of their former ally. Strangely paralleling the activities of Nero, a new monster strolled in and took control of the Eternal City after the collapse of Mussolini's government in July 1943. Adolf Hitler, like Nero, targeted a religious minority, the Jews. His minions wreaked their cruelty not in public arenas, but mostly in less public concentration camps. It was the same base, cruel execution of men, women, and children, made even more widespread and sinister by modern communications and the use of modern technology to create an assembly line of death for millions of innocent people. The Nazis began a roundup of Italy's large Jewish population for deportation to concentration camps in the north, where most of them faced extermination. The ancient Jewish population of Rome and Italy was targeted for death. The Refugee Bureau the three amigos hit upon a happy scheme to deceive the Nazis while paradoxically aiding Axis prisoners of war. After the catastrophic German losses in North Africa and Sicily, the Allies held several hundred thousand German and Italian prisoners, including the remnants of Rommel's Africa Corps, as well as many Italian civilians interned in Libya. Montini placed Carroll and McGuff in a special Vatican refugee bureau, ostensibly to aid the Germans and Italians held by the Allies. The choice of two Americans to lead the bureau seemed logical to the Nazis and fascists, as they would be best able to deal with their fellow Americans who held most of the prisoners and internees. They did actually aid the Axis prisoners, but this, unknown to the Nazis, was only a small part of what they did. The true aim of the Refugee Bureau was to save the Jews and Rome while aiding the Allies. The Bureau provided a cover for Carroll and McGuff to cross Allied lines and actually meet with Allied leaders. They also used the Bureau to aid refugees the Nazis did not have in mind, Jewish refugees, and escaped Allied POWs. Much of the Vatican Refugee Bureau's funding came from Catholic Charities USA, whose largest funder was George Strake. He joined the Executive Committee of Catholic Charities in 1940, following Walter Carroll's visit. 
Drawing also upon virtually unlimited financing deposited in a bank in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Carroll and Montini embarked upon dangerous schemes to aid the Allies, save Rome, and save as many Italian Jews as possible, still using the Refugee Bureau as a cover. Carroll and McGuff exchanged their United States passports for Vatican passports, repeatedly crossing enemy lines to bring intelligence and requests for Rome's preservation from Pope Pius XII to General Mark Clark, commander in Italy, and General Walter Bettel Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff. The two priests were virtually the only Americans in Rome, an enemy capital. On at least one occasion, Carroll carried Pius's message directly to Washington, D.C. and met with President Franklin D. Roosevelt for two and a half hours. Discovery of these activities would have brought execution. Saving Rome In July 1943, more than 900 Allied bombers attacked the rail yards in Rome, which were being used to support Axis troops in the south killing more than 4,500 Romans. This was one of only two Allied air raids on Rome. The other was a pilot error, which together caused thousands of deaths in 1943 and 1944. McGuff and Montini worked directly with Wild Bill Donovan, head of the United States OSS, later the CIA, to reduce or eliminate casualties while rescuing both the Jews and downed Allied pilots. Meanwhile, Nazi stormtroopers ruled Italy, with the SS rounding up Jews and many others for transportation to extermination camps. Montini, Carroll, and McGuff labored to dissuade the Americans from further attacks on the Eternal City. Rome was the Germans' logistical and transportation base. In a real sense, all roads led to Rome. An important part of the mission of the Three Amigos was to dissuade the Americans from taking the logical military step of destroying the Germans' logistical and transportation center by bombing Rome. In effect, they had to ask for the terrible sacrifice of enduring thousands of Allied casualties to preserve the Eternal City. The Allied invasion at Salerno in Italy's toe led only to a slow, bloody Allied advance north along the Italian boot. So the Allies determined to strike directly at Rome through massive landings at Anzio in central Italy, less than 40 miles from Rome. The Anzio landing on January 22, 1944, miscarried. The Allies were bottled up in a small beachhead perimeter, sitting ducks for the German artillery. Winston Churchill described the invasion as a great whale beached on the sand. For three long months until late May 1944, the pinned-down Allies suffered 43,000 casualties, some of their greatest single casualties of the war, vastly greater than those who would later die on the beaches of Normandy. Two Ranger battalions lost 761 out of 767 men. It was the most disastrous Allied landing of World War II. The Nazis marched Allied prisoners captured at Anzio to Rome. There they photographed them in staged marches past the Colosseum, surrounded by Nazi soldiers, a publicity stunt designed to humiliate the United States. Carroll's trips back and forth across the warring lines took a terrible toll on him. His travels took him to Washington to meet with FDR for several hours, and he took several trips to Algiers to meet with Allied leaders. He went to the dangerous Anzio beachhead to minister to and share the suffering of the Allied troops trapped and dying there by the thousands. All the while, he forwarded intelligence reports from behind German lines to General Mark Clark and his staff. In April 1944, Carroll suffered a major heart attack at Anzio, nearly ending his life. In typical fashion, as soon as he could stand again, although gray, weak, and frail, he renewed his activities, meeting with Clark and Eisenhower's chief of staff, Bettel Smith, to aid the Allies, save the Jews, and preserve the city of Rome. Against all odds, Rome was not destroyed like so many other ancient cities of Western Europe. Cologne, Warsaw, 
Kiev, Hamburg, and others, which did not survive the ravages of World War II. Walter Carroll was largely responsible. As General Mark Clark, Allied commander in Italy, later said, Without the helpfulness and intelligence of Carroll, the outcome in Italy would have been much different. Also, without Carroll's efforts, it is likely that the necropolis would have become a buried afterthought in a new set of ruins produced by modern warfare. Rome was, and is, the Eternal City. The city contains the physical remains of more than 2,000 years of Western civilization, from the Romans through the Dark and Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Beyond its significance to Christians and Italians, it stands at the heart of much of Western history and culture from the Roman Republic through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. With its collection of buildings like the Pantheon, the Colosseum, the Forum, and its works of art like the Trevi Fountain, the Spanish Steps, the statues of Bernini, the Sistine Chapel, and the Pieta of Michelangelo, Rome is truly the legacy of mankind. On June 3, 1944, Walter Carroll's mother was interviewed by the Pittsburgh Press. Asked whether she was anxious for her son since Rome was about to fall, she said she was not, as she was sure he would be nowhere close. She must have been quite surprised to learn the truth. General Clark entered Rome in June 1944 with Eisenhower's chief of staff, Bedell Smith, riding in a jeep guided by Walter Carroll en route to meet directly with Pope Pius XII. Carroll was noticeably gray. The photo of their entry into Rome became one of the iconic photos of World War II, published even in Pittsburgh. Mrs. Carroll's reaction upon seeing it is unknown. In addition to saving Rome from the advancing Allies, the Vatican had an equally difficult task of preventing Rome's destruction by the retreating Germans. Pius and Cass negotiated with Catholic German generals to designate Rome as an open city, apparently in direct violation of an order from Hitler to SS General Karl Wolf to seize the Vatican and Pope Pius XII. Saving the Jews Equally as difficult as saving Rome was saving Italy's ancient Jewish population. Here, Montini, Carroll, and McGuff again played leading roles. For example, on the outskirts of Rome, the church owned a dilapidated estate called the Janiculum Hill property, with a building named Casa San Giovanni as its centerpiece. This served as a dormitory for Jews and other refugees in a labyrinth of underground rooms and tunnels ventilated by shafts hidden by the outside shrubbery. The property had been acquired by the church with Strake's financing for use by North American Catholic organizations prior to World War II. It was directly across from a building occupied by the Gestapo. Much like an underground railroad, Carroll and McGuff hid more than 100 of Rome's Jews there at a time during the Holocaust, along with 1,200 sheep bought to provide agricultural cover. They disguised the Jewish refugees, sometimes mixed with downed Allied pilots, as shepherds. There is no record of how well the Allied pilots actually performed as shepherds. The stories of the so-called Roman escape line, along which Allied prisoners of war were shepherded through Rome, often in cassocks, to Allied lines farther south, are the stuff of legend. Carroll engaged in a bevy of other schemes and scams to save Italy's Jews, ranging from hiding them in the bottom levels of ancient Roman catacombs to dressing them in cassocks. Another person working with Montini on this operation was Father Hugh O'Flaherty, a fiery Irishman known as the Irish Pimpernel for his activities and schemes in defeating the SS and saving the Jews. When the SS placed a death warrant on O'Flaherty's head, and drew a white line across St. Peter's Square to mark the boundary beyond which priests would be killed for such activities, the Refugee Bureau continued with its schemes from inside the Vatican itself. While the Nazis captured and killed several hundred thousand Italian Jews, a substantial majority of Jews in Italy were saved, a feat not achieved in any other European country. Carroll's biographer, George Keeman, 
stated that the Vatican was responsible for saving some 850,000 Jews, more than all other religious groups and relief organizations combined. At all times, Carroll drew upon seemingly unlimited and mysterious funds from a bank in his hometown of Pittsburgh. At war's end, the Allies liberated tens of thousands of starving, diseased prisoners in the terrible concentration camps at Dachau and Buchenwald. Within 24 hours of their liberation, Walter Carroll and Joseph McGuff arrived first at Dachau and then at Buchenwald with convoys of food, medical supplies, and more than 50 medical personnel. In at least six other concentration camps, the Refugee Bureau appeared soon after liberation, saving many thousands of victims of the Nazis. Given the horrific starvation and terrible medical condition of the inmates, it is clear thousands would have died without the timely relief provided by the Bureau. There is no way to estimate the incalculable number of lives saved by these activities. An Italian inmate of Dachau at the time of Carol's arrival would later write of their despair turning to joy upon seeing Carol's caravan. Carol's activities were the stuff of legend, and stories about them multiplied. One story circulating shortly after World War II concerned the legendary, irascible General George S. Patton. Patton seized a Catholic seminary in Germany to use as a military headquarters, throwing the German seminarians onto the street. Carroll traveled to Patton's headquarters to confront him, demanding return of the seminary to the church. At first, General Patton refused. A war was in progress, but Carroll challenged him again with a divine power even greater than the mighty Third Army, and crusty George Patton surrendered for the only time during World War II, telling his aides to turn that damn building back to the Pope. To Patton's discomfort, Carroll stayed in the southern German castle that Patton was using as headquarters until the order was actually carried out. War's End The Catholic Church has various papal orders that may be awarded to laymen to recognize their contributions to the Church and the world. The highest of these is the Order of St. Sylvester, named after the Pope who reigned during the construction of the original St. Peter's Basilica, circa 330. Within the order there are various ranks, the very highest of which is Knight Commander, the highest possible recognition of a layman by the Catholic Church. There are only a handful of living recipients of this honor. In July 1944, immediately after the liberation of Rome, Wild Bill Donovan, head of the American OSS and later the CIA, was presented this honor by Pope Pius XII to recognize his efforts with Walter Carroll to save Rome from destruction. In 1946, George Strake was likewise made a Knight Commander of St. Sylvester, receiving the recognition in person from Pope Pius himself. This is an honor conferred on laymen of extraordinary merit, such as Oscar Schindler, of Schindler's List fame, who was later presented the same honor. Chapter 13 The Flood and the Curse The Church and the Communists Following the defeat of the Axis powers in 1945, a tremendous conflict broke out in Italy between the Communists and the Democratic parties for post-war control of Italy. Pius XII had seen the massive persecution of the Eastern European Church as well as the Catholic Church in China, Spain, and elsewhere by the Communists. He had personally witnessed and nearly been killed in a 1919 massacre by the Communists in Munich. He was deeply alarmed that the communists were filling the vacuum left in Italy by the fascists. To counteract the communists, Pius XII constructed church schools and family centers in the heart of devastated urban areas with a strong communist presence. The schools would not only serve a humanitarian purpose, but would also combat the otherwise omnipresent communist party, providing an alternative to communism. Turning once again to Montini, McGuff, Carroll, and Strake, the church began construction of church schools and family centers in poor, largely communist areas. Garbatella, 
an impoverished neighborhood in the south of Rome, is the subject of an Italian political proverb. As goes Garbatella, so goes Rome. As goes Rome, so goes Italy. So the very first church the three amigos and Strake built was St. Philip Neri in Garbatella. In a country full of spectacular but increasingly empty cathedrals, this new church was smaller and family-oriented, modeled on the more vigorous American churches. Unlike the great cathedrals, it was not simply a place of worship, but a center for education and many family activities. This was the Pope's answer to the communists. Based on its success, more than 38 other family-oriented churches were quickly built throughout Italy. The post-war Catholic Church in Italy was reinvigorated by these new churches. In the 1948 Italian elections, the Communist Party sought to take power. Time magazine said Italy was on the brink of catastrophe. The communists had just seized Czechoslovakia in a February 1948 coup. Poland, Hungary, Romania, and the Baltic states were all occupied, and Berlin was blockaded by Stalin's order and kept alive only by an American airlift. It appeared that all of Western Europe might crumble to Stalin. Had the communists taken power in Italy, it would likely have outflanked and destroyed NATO. It is probable that the future of Europe hung in the balance based on the outcome of the 1948 Italian elections. A communist victory was avoided after Pius XII spoke against the party. The communists carried much of northern Italy, but were crushed everywhere else. The old proverb proved true. Garbatella voted against the communists, followed by Rome and the rest of Italy. At least one contemporary newspaper account attributed the salvation of Italy to Montini and the three Americans, Strake, Carroll, and McGuff. The Italian church itself enjoyed a new burst of energy for a time, engaging with families through these new churches. At St. Philip Neri and Garbatella, portraits of George Strake and Walter Carroll today sit side by side, a testimony to their great contribution. Strake in his portrait wears a quizzical look, perhaps wondering how a Texas wildcatter ended up in Garbatella. Through all the years of clever maneuvering by the three amigos and turmoil with the fascists, Nazis, and communists, the excavations for Peter's tomb and their results continued to be held in strict secrecy, and the presumed relics of Peter continued to rest in a box in Pius XII's apartment. The Curse and the Flood, 1949 since the early days of the Basilica, writings claimed that a peculiar curse was associated with any attempt to excavate or disturb Peter's bones. Every historical attempt to find Peter's relics had faced unexplainable and puzzling events. Pope Urban VIII, who had ordered the initial excavation for the Bernini Baldacchino in the 17th century, himself fell ill, and many excavators at that time unexpectedly died while working in the necropolis. Roman citizens, never passing on a good superstition, linked the proximity of these inexplicable events with a curse. The superstitious belief that a curse follows those who disturb graves is hardly a new one. The Roman belief in such a curse probably protected Peter's grave during the great early persecutions of Rome. Even the tombstone of the great William Shakespeare at Stratford-upon-Avon bears the inscription... Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. The line between archaeologists and grave robbers is sometimes a narrow one. Many of the great tombs of history, for example, that of Genghis Khan, remain undiscovered or unopened partly because of fear or aversion. Most of those responsible for the excavation of Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt in 1922 died remarkably quick deaths, attributed by the superstitious to the so-called Curse of Tut. It was thus no surprise to superstitious workmen when disaster befell the necropolis in 1949. 
During the fall of that year, immense rains inundated Italy and Rome. The Tiber rose to flood stage, but was still held within its banks by high stone embankments. In ancient times, before the embankments were built, Rome was regularly flooded by the Tiber. Now, suddenly and inexplicably, the necropolis began to fill with water, as if it alone and not its surroundings had returned to ancient times. Pumps were brought in but could not keep up with the rising waters, which reached three to four feet deep in the necropolis. It appeared the work of a decade and preserved antiquities of ancient Rome would be lost. Was it a special curse? St. Peter's curse? Finally, when all seemed hopeless, the collapse of an ancient pipe was discovered as the source of the flood. With repairs, the water slowly receded and the necropolis was saved, although not without damage. The secret excavations resumed, while the outside world remained completely oblivious to both the crisis and the excavations. The Story Breaks, 1949 Beyond question, the excavators must have chafed at Pius's decade-long insistence on secrecy. Having discovered the great family tombs completely intact and believing they had discovered Peter himself, they wanted fame and renown for their work. The long wait ended on August 22, 1949, when an Italian journalist, Camille Gianfara, whose sources are still secret and unknown, published the story of the excavations. The New York Times carried a front-page story headlined, Bones of St. Peter Found. The cover of Time magazine also proclaimed the discovery. Over a year later, Pius XII broke his silence in a radio address. He affirmed that Peter's tomb had been found. He also indicated that human bones had been found but needed additional testing. Shortly after his radio address in 1950, Pius invited George Strake and his family to Rome to celebrate the great success. The Strakes met in Rome with Montini, Cass, McGuff, and others involved in the successful excavation. They met directly with Pius XII, who offered the church's thanks for Strake's help. Perua and the excavators took bows for their accomplishments. George Strake was elated that his great project had been a wonderful success, validating his own beliefs and assisting the church he so deeply loved. The Strakes believed the trip one of the great moments of their lives. Publicly, George Strake still kept his involvement wholly secret, and the church, likewise, honored his anonymity. Death of Walter Carroll the Strakes were unable to meet with Walter Carroll, their friend and contact for the past decade. Earlier in 1950, Carroll's great run as the genius behind impossible schemes had ended. As his biographer George Keeman wrote, he lived to accomplish these tasks in pursuit of peace in Europe, and after the war was over, he laid down and died. His brave heart, which had fought coronary illness since childhood, stopped in Washington, D.C. Tributes flowed from all over the world. President Truman, General Mark Clark, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg, and even an Italian prisoner at Dachau who recalled Carroll's timely life-saving arrival there. Montini and McGuff were deeply stricken by the loss of their great and brave friend, in September 1951, Montini and McGuff visited the United States. Montini is quoted as telling Carol's mother, I have made a pilgrimage to the grave of my friend. Together with McGuff, he visited the Pittsburgh grave of their mutual friend, wartime comrade, and conspirator in a variety of concealed activities. Carol's early death left a hole in Montini's heart. In later years, even as Pope Paul VI, he would on occasion visit with Carroll's brothers and no doubt express his sense of loss at brave Walter Carroll's premature death after surviving World War II. In the 1950s, George Strake, with other friends of Walter Carroll, financed the building of a large bell tower at Carroll's home church in Pittsburgh. Visitors today still describe the architecture of the bell tower and the church as stunning. The builders found it appropriate because Walter Carroll 
was a bell for decency and truth in an uncertain world. Now, with the bell ringing at dawn and dusk, they could look up and know he had gone to a wonderful place. In 1951, Montini traveled across the United States by car, delighted to experience this strange country he had learned so much about from Carol. Montini and McGuff drove all the way from Pittsburgh to Colorado to visit George Strake on his 1,200-acre estate at Glen Erie. For several days, they relived with the Strakes their wartime stories, spoke much of brave Walter Carroll and his schemes, and filled Strake in on the details of the apparently successful location of Peter's relics. They enjoyed together the magic of the Rockies, Queens Canyon, Eagle Lake, and Glen Erie. The Strakes retain to this day the bed in which the future Pope slept and occasionally offer the use of it to visitors. The great mystery of Peter appeared solved. The story was closed. Until a difficult and troublesome woman of great capability with an obsession for truth appeared on the scene. In reality, the greatest discoveries lay ahead, not behind. It would be Margarita Guarducci, not Ferrua and the excavators, who would make them. <laughs>